video break here to, to do a clean cut. Usually I don't broadcast this uh, um, beginning part on the Googles. Um, I wish there was a way I could actually cut them into two pieces and leave them separate, but this is kind of just for us that show up early and hang out. So I'm going to go ahead and give a little bit of silence and we will rock and roll. Hey folks, welcome to the Safety Solutions Academy Google Hangout. This is Google Hangout number 14. And of course, we have our good friend Grant Cunningham co-hosting with us tonight. Grant Cunningham is the uh, purveyor from Personal Security Institute. You'll find him at www.personalsecurity.us. Make sure I got that site right, Grant. That's personalsecurity.us. Is that right? That, that is correct. You got it. Bada bing. We are here tonight to talk with you folks about the concept of critical defensive skills. And we wanted to talk with you folks about this because, you know, the, the Safety Solutions Academy Google Hangout is the place where everyday people can come to find out what it is they need to know about personal security, to unravel the, the challenges that face them when it comes to defensive training, and to demystify the gun. And we're going to start a series tonight that's really centered on, I would say, that, that center section of that, that little slogan or tagline, whatever you want to call it. And that part is, is unraveling the challenges of defensive training. What do you train? How do you train it? How do you identify what's important? And that's what we're going to start laying out for you tonight. And then we're going to give you some really hard, over the next few weeks, some, some concrete uh, sets of, of things to look at that you might choose to label as your critical defensive skills and give you some pointers on how it is you can make sure you get them trained and get them trained properly. So, Grant, how are you doing tonight? Other than the, the Googles being a whore like they usually are, um, how are things, uh, things going? Uh, things are things are going pretty well. Uh, you know, once we get the, the silly mic stuff worked out, and uh, but other than that, things are going well. I'm having a uh, a cup of tea and a very very nice little uh, cider here. Oh, outstanding, Grant. Um, I brought some beverages as well tonight. I have a Sierra Nevada Nooner. I felt like uh, going with a lower alcohol content IPA was probably the appropriate choice tonight. Am I? Yeah, I think so. Or is it just I am? Um, I'm, I'm about to fix that one. It is flip-flopped. It crazy. is back. Well, we'll have to fix the backwardness. I'm glad that you were having a, a good day over there in Oregon. We had some fabulous weather here. I spent the majority of my day outside splitting wood, which is actually one of my favorite things to do, and uh, um, got a lot of that done. Didn't get as much of it done as I would have wanted. Um, hopefully, I just flipped myself there. Good. Looks better. We'll give a reintroduction to the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. There, there we go. Yes, okay, we've got it. A, is a better read for you. A technical difficulties abound. You know, what makes me feel good, though, Grant, I don't know if you've done this, but I've uh, taken a look at some other Google Hangouts. There's not a Google Hangout out there that isn't a technical disaster, and I think that that is, uh, says a lot about <laughs> what it is that, uh, that Google does or doesn't do well. But... Uh, so I'll drink you, that. Yeah, right, exactly. What do you say we dive in, Grant, and, and okay. start getting into the meat of this? You know, you and I have uh, a weekly phone call that we have that, that we treat as a, um, I, guess, I guess I'd fairly call it a mastermind, where we bounce ideas off each other, um, look to each other for support in areas that we're having challenges, and uh, part of what that every Monday call is is talking about what we're going to be talking about on Thursday in the Google Hangout. And, you know, we went back and reviewed all the different things that we've been talking about. And we came up with this concept of talking about the, the critical defensive skills. And both of us really kind of honed in on it. And we want to use this week as kind of an introduction to what it is that our idea of critical defensive skills are. And anybody that's spent some time around Safety Solutions Academy probably knows the idea that critical defensive skills are what it is that I want my company to be about. Um, I've named my courses Critical Defensive Handgun, Critical Defensive Carbine, Critical Defensive Shotgun. And, and I do that because I want to bring to people the most important skills that they are likely to need should they be forced to use uh, their firearm or any other skill to be able to defend themselves and their families in that critical life-threatening situation. Why is it that you glommed on to that concept of critical defensive skills, Grant. What was it about that that was important to you? Well, uh, I, I guess about a decade ago now, I, you know, right around a decade ago, I was talking with someone, uh, someone who had been to a class uh, at a fairly well-known 
uh, place, and they were talking about the the vital skills, which is the, the same idea, you know, vital skills, right. critical skills. But the 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 idea was that, that one of the classes that he was was taking, uh, the the instructor had called a vital skill being able to employ his handgun at a hundred yards, and that was an, a vital skill. And I said, you know. Uh, that strikes me as, as not what I would call a vital skill because if it's not something that you're likely to use, uh, if it's not something that stands some mathematical certainty of, of needing in a conflict, then it's probably not vital that you spend the time and effort and, and money and, and ammunition and all that other stuff to train in that. And so I, I got to thinking... Uh, now for you know eight or ten years about this idea of what is a vital skill, what is I important to to study, what is important to train, and of course it goes back to that idea that that, that we talk about and and we certainly uh, from the combat focused shooting courses that you and I both teach, we talk about the idea of of plausibility about managing scarcity, managing scarce training resources uh, by focusing on things that are plausible, and it's not just a matter of, of training in, in things that are plausible and, and training to manage our, our scarce training resources. But there's also a, um, a, a maintenance issue that goes along here. Um, these, are, these are skills that also need to be, main, be maintained. I, uh, somebody here a couple of weeks ago, somebody offered me a great deal, and I mean a great deal, and I always love a great deal, but somebody offered me a great deal on a 48-inch wide Epson photo mural printer, and I thought, man, that'd be cool to have, right? A 48-inch Epson mural printer, and anybody who's owned an Epson photo printer knows that if you don't use them like every three or four days, the heads clog up, and if you let them go for a few weeks, the heads clog up so bad that either you waste a whole bunch of ink trying to get them to work again, or in worst case situations, they don't work at all. But I was taken by this great deal on this 48-inch mural printer, and realizing that, you know, I'm probably rarely, if ever, going to use one of those things. And at the same time, I have to maintain it. I have to keep it in running conditions so that I can use it. And so we have to pay attention to these vital skills that way, too. What can we maintain with our once a month, two hours at the range? So it comes down to an issue of not just training and things that are, that are important, things that are plausible, and finding out what those are, but also something that we can maintain and that we know we're going to use. So it gets into uh, I, everything that I do in defensive shooting. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to describe it, Fred. Or excuse me, uh, Grant. Um, I'm just looking at comments, and we've got some comments coming in from Fred, and uh, we got somebody coming in, uh, Denim and Blue from uh, from New Jersey, or Denim and Blue. So we got, we got lots of folks on today. That's great. Keep the comments coming. We'll come to them bit by bit as we go through our, our conversation today about critical defensive skills. And Grant, you know, the, the learning of the skills is resource intensive, and the maintenance of the skills is resource intensive. And it's probably why I don't have a 1968 Mustang in my garage is because I don't necessarily want to have the uh, the upkeep of having to drive and, and maintain that car or that that skill in the idea of defensive use. If it just sits, eventually it's going to deteriorate into nothing, and and that's just not a viable option for me. It kind of fits into that same concept of the printer that you just talked about. So that's a, a pretty good good way to look at it. So the the question then comes, Grant. For those folks that are out there, they're trying to find classes. You know, and I've got Brian Vance here that's joined us tonight, and he's talking about the idea. He's just gotten his credentials to teach concealed carry. He hasn't taught any classes yet. He wants to know what advice do we have. The advice that I give him is whittle it down to what it is that's critical. Now, now, Brian, I understand a little bit about Michigan, and I know that you guys are either teaching PPOTH, the NRA course, uh, personal protection outside the home or personal protection inside the home for CCW. Don't remember which it is. So you've got a set curriculum. But at the same time, we've got to whittle our curriculum as instructors down to what it is that's critical. The consumer, the person that's going to the training class, has to will what it is that they look for down to what's critical. So the obvious question is, is how do we figure out what it is that's critical? You're telling me, Grant, that a 100-yard shot with a pistol isn't critical. It's not plausible. How do we sort out what it is that is possible? How do you do that for your students? You know, interestingly enough, it, it, from from our standpoint, it's easier than, than from the student's standpoint because figuring out what's critical and what's plausible 
uh, you either have to do two things. You either have to become a subject matter expert in how attacks happen and how to best deal with those attacks, or you have to find somebody that you can trust who is. And, and, and it's the latter part that I think gets a lot of people into trouble because um, with, without understanding sort of a, a base understanding of what's going on, it's very, very hard then to, if, for instance, if you don't understand how the vast majority of ha attacks happen, if somebody comes up and tells you that training in, in being able to shoot 100 yards with a handgun is a vital skill, uh, well, you're going to trust them that, that they're correct. Um, it does require a little bit of knowledge on the student's part going in to at least have some sort of idea of, of how attacks happen and, and that sort of thing. But also, I think they have to look at the in instructor, excuse me, the instructor, and listen to what he's telling them and ask themselves the question, you know, does, does, does this sound right? Um, does this sound like something I'm going to need when I'm going to the Dunkin' Donuts to get my cup of coffee in the morning, as opposed to taking out a, a tower for, full of terrorists? Um, those are the, the, the kinds of questions that you have to ask. Does it sound plausible? Does it sound reasonable? Does it sound like something out of my own life? And if it sounds something like that, it, it's probably getting close to what is a vital or a critical skill. If not, it probably isn't. That's interesting that you bring that up, Grant, because there are a lot of instructors out there that, you know, we're talking about going to Dunkin' Donuts. We're talking about going in the morning. I mean, maybe there are some people that go pretty early. So, you know, should they be throwing night vision goggles on and training with night vision goggles? Some people might say, oh, yeah, that sounds like fun. That sounds like a good idea. Well, unless you wear those NVGs every day, it doesn't do you a darn bit of good. Um, and, and so the idea being, look for what it is that fits in with your life is really important. Another place where people get tripped up is taking a look at what it is that they're learning and trying to apply it to some place that doesn't necessarily fit. You know, you brought off that 100-yard shot. I want to stick with that. Because a lot of people will look at that and they say, well, if I can hit that target from 100 yards, man, I'm going to be really good at hitting it from 7 yards. And what they don't realize and understand is that it may be two fully complete different skill sets that allow you to get the hit at a distance at 100 yards compared to what it is that you might do at close at reasonable self-defense distances like 3 or 5 or 7 yards. And, and don't get caught up on the yardages because it's not just uh, excuse me, odd yardages, folks. I mean, it, it could be anywhere in that range that, that we commonly see that. And so be careful in trying to apply what it is you learn in class A to your real life that might be like B. You have to be really careful about that. So great. I, I love your suggestion of saying look at what your life looks like. I'm going to make another suggestion. Watch the evening news. Take a look at the crime water. Take a look at the armed citizen stories that are in your NRA publications. You're probably an NRA member. If you're not, you probably should be. Um, and, and you get one free magazine with that, that, that membership. In every single magazine, there are stories about armed citizens. Look at those stories. Study those things. That gives us some kind of a basis for what it is that other people that are probably a lot like us, everyday folks that go around carrying a gun to make their lives safer, we can learn from their experiences and what things might be like for us. Any thoughts on that, Grant? I think that's a great idea. Watching the evening news, as depressing as it is, and I understand it's depressing, but watching the e evening news is uh, is a great learning experience. Focusing on those things that are actually happening to people. You know, I talk about the the difference between um, uh, in in training the difference between being real and being authentic. Um, for instance, if I if I put together a room full of, of furniture and say, okay, we're going to practice uh, you know defending ourselves in this room, right? Um, it may be authentic in the sense that that the furniture is of the type that people use in their houses and that sort of thing, but it's not real because it's not my room. Right. So paying attention to, to what's real, what your reality is. Uh, if, if your reality is that, you, is, that, is that you work in an armored car, well, the things that you do and the things you're going to tra train are going to be different than the guy who works uh, you know, in an office building. So, you, yeah, you do need to, to look at the evening news, look at what other people are going through, and then look at your own life and say, where are the commonalities? What, do I, what did I share with this person? If, if it was an attack at a 7-Eleven, at a do I ever go to a 7-Eleven? Do I go to a 7-Eleven in that part of town? Do I go to a 7-Eleven uh, at that time of the day? 
all of those things play into judging whether or not the, the, the skills that somebody is teaching you to apply to these situations are valid. And, and really, Grant, when we think about this, I'm being reminded of, of um, it happens to be a blog post that, that was put out today and I shared it on social media. It's been an issue that you and I have been um, back and forth commenting about. You um, have, have looked at this issue, the Remington R51, and the fact that um, we've got writers that have said, wow, this is a great gun, this is a fabulous gun, and now we've got consumers who are saying this gun's a disaster. What we really need to know and understand from the consumer standpoint is how it is, the nuances of how the defensive training industry works, and understanding how it is that we can vet an instructor to find out are they teaching real stuff. And, and I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about that so that folks can kind of dig in and do their research. If you just pick the guy that's closest to you, whose ad you see on Facebook or on the Googles or anyplace else, there's no promise that you're going to get reality. There's no promise that you're going to get critical skills. There's no promise that you're going to get what it is that's really going to work for you. There's just a promise you're going to go to class, they're going to take your money, and you may or may not leave with something. So Grant, do you have any suggestions for how your students can vet instructors to understand what they're getting into? Well, you know, the the uh, the way that a lot of people would have you do is look at the resume. And uh, the, the, the problem with doing that is that, for instance, if I'm looking at a guy, I'm, I'm looking at taking a class from him, and he's a, a Navy SEAL, right? Everybody's a Navy SEAL, right? right sure. Let's say he's, he was for real. And let's, this guy's let's for just one second, Grant. Let's take one step back because we work with some guys that actually are Navy SEALs. Yeah. If somebody's telling you they're a Navy SEAL, they're probably not a Navy they're SEAL. They're probably right? not a Navy SEAL. Okay, that's um, what we know. Right, yeah, that's, right. yeah that's, that's exactly it. But, you know, if somebody, if somebody did serve in Special Forces or something and, and they're holding a class and they're saying, okay, great, we're going to teach you about defensive handgunning. And the question is, okay, great, are you going to teach me the stuff that you learned in Navy SEAL school? Right or or you know uh, in the police academy or or whatever, are you going to teach me that stuff because that stuff may or may not be applicable to me? Now, if the guy says, "Yeah, I'm going to teach you to be a, a warrior like I learned to be," and and we're going to teach you all this great counter terrorism stuff, um, that's probably an indication to you that those are may not be critical skills for you because. Right. You know, taking down an an oil rig filled with terrorists with air, close air support is a very very different thing than having to deal with somebody who just broke down your door in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, now, if and and this is not to denigrate the the the, the really good police instructors and the really good uh, um, military instructors that have come into the private sector. If, however, they say, you know, I learned a lot of really cool stuff in Navy SEAL school, and what I one of the things I learned is motivation and dedication and 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 practice strategies and all that good stuff and I'm going to take that I'm going to apply that to skills that are important to you in your daily life. Uh, so I'm going to use my experience then you know as as a Navy SEAL or as a, or as a SWAT cop or whatever. I'm going to use those things that are important to you that are actually valid for you and use that to teach you the skills that maybe I don't use in my day job but I know that you'll use. So. Some questioning has to go on. The, the, the problem is that, that resumes and websites are, are one, di one directional. They're from the, the, the website to you. And you really do need that interaction to be able to say, okay, great, um, I've seen your website, seen all the pictures with you and the, and the really cool you know, Humvees and things that you've got, but here's some questions for you. And I think the first key there is that the instructor is willing to answer the questions and is able to answer the question. I think that's the real key. I think those are great ideas, Grant, great concepts. And, and I think the other thing the consumer needs to do is they need to probably step beyond the copy that's on a website. Um, I'm going to be very pointed here and let you folks know there's a specific reason why I'm doing a Google Hangout. I mean, there's multiple reasons. I want to give good quality information to you, and I can't have everybody in a class every day, all day. It, it just doesn't work for my lifestyle, for your lifestyle. So I want to get information out of people. But at the same time, I want people to learn who it is that Paul Carlson is as an instructor. I mean, I'm giving an instructional snapshot of who I am, what I'm about, how I'm able to communicate ideas, the experiences that I have. I mean, the, the interaction we had with Nate at the beginning of the show about access sites, 
is critical information for people making decisions. And so I would highly encourage you to seek out instructors that are putting out quality content for you, both in, in copy, written word, but also look for audio and, and video sources from those instructors so that you can find out for free, for goodness sakes, whether or not those skills seem to be critical for you. And you know, I've had a podcast for a long time before I ran this Google Hangout. I've got 340 some episodes. I think I might even be up to 350 episodes now. You can go back through and you can see where my priorities are and how they've shifted over time towards what it is that I believe is critical. And so taking the time to investigate that instructor, to vet them through the internet, to talk with them, to interact. You know, we've had some great interaction today, I think is really, really important. Now, Fred has chimed in here with a question, a comment, and he, he made the, the comment that he loves the distinctive language of critical defensive handgun. And that's the course that I teach. And his question is, is how is that different from combat focus Fact of the matter is, right now, today, Fred, there's very little difference. It simply is a matter of I prefer that very distinctive language to let people know what it is that I'm about, excuse me, that I am about, and that I want to teach them. I want to teach them those critical defensive skills. And, and that's really an important concept. So good question. I'm glad that you asked that. So, Grant, we've now taken a look at how to, to figure out what critical defensive skills are for ourselves and how to find an instructor that teaches them. What is it that we need to make sure that we do when we train in critical skills? Do you have any thoughts on the actual training process itself? Well, of, of, of course the instructor needs to, to first do his homework and, and look uh, with a very jaundiced eye to everything that he or she is teaching. And, and I mean everything down to, to, down to the littlest detail. Is this really important to my students in their daily lives? And to the point of, of even making a list. I mean, you know, uh, uh, what are the important things for somebody who's going to defend themselves against a very specific threat? And, and do it in a scenario fashion, i.e., you know, somebody broke down your door in the middle of the night. What are the, the skills that you're going to use? And break it down. You're probably going to use good grasp on the gun, right? You're probably going to use, uh, uh, you know, good trigger control. You're, you know, you probably may use a flashlight so you're shooting one-handed and, and all that other stuff. So break it down to actually individual tasks that have to be done and say, okay, are these applicable to the guy who's breaking down the door in the middle of the night? Are these mm -hmm. applicable to the guy who just jerked open your car door? Um, every single step of it, and it requires a lot of work on the part of the instructor. You can't just pick up a canned um, drill from somebody or a, or a canned curriculum and teach it and say, hey, I'm teaching really good critical skills. It's incumbent upon the instructor to do the thinking that goes into that, and if necessary, if you come up with something, you know, like shooting at 100 yards, okay, that's just not critical. You have to have the courage to excise that from your program entirely and put in something that is more important. So it really starts from the instructional standpoint with looking at each and every little detail of everything that you teach and asking yourself, does it fit a plausible scenario? Yeah, I think that's really important, Grant. And when we look at, at the resource factors, the plausibility and the concepts that, that stand behind those critical skills, we have to understand that at some point in time, for some people, that 100-yard pistol shot might start to make some sense to designate some training resources into. Uh, you know, when we've got the skills that are high probability, you know, uh, Brian is talking about here in the comments, he's talking about the idea that a lot of things happen within 10 feet. Yeah, that's a very common distance for interaction. Once we have that master, we have, uh, or at least a, 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 what we would call a good enough um, mastery of the skills of, of deploying that handgun and being able to, to get ourselves off the X and engage that target at close distance, is there a time when a 100-yard shot might take five rounds out of 1,000? Yeah, there sure is. But we have to make sure that we're dedicating our resources to what is most likely. You know, one of the things that, that I found through training myself and through watching other people train and working with other people is the fact that we like to do what we're good at. We like to do what's fun. And if you you know if you are really good at something, sometimes you have to step beyond that and step outside. You have to look at what it is that really matters, what's really critical, and continue on from there. So we've got a couple of questions that have come off that kind of address some critical skills grants. So I'd like to kind of dive down the radical with uh, with Brian and, and Denham and kind of address these 
these questions. And Brian says, Grant, very good info. info. I do know that most attacks are within 10 feet. Awareness is key, obviously. So is awareness training just as important as firearms training. And that's a great question, Brian. And, and Grant, this is almost like a, a loaded question for you and me when it comes to awareness training. Because I, I remember the moment when I was, I was actually doing some instructor development. I was teaching other instructors, and you were in the class that I was teaching. And I saw you sit back and just kind of put your chin into your hand and just shake your head. And I thought, either he is ready to eat me alive, which was one possibility, or he really agrees with what I'm saying. It happened to be awareness we were talking about. So I'll let you go. You know, is awareness training as important as firearms training? I, I, I think awareness training, as it's usually approached in the defensive shooting world, uh, Brian, is... I, I hesitate to use the word silly, but I, I think that's probably a pretty good word because the, the and in fact I wrote an article about this about four years ago now at the start of the Personal Defense Network. One of the first articles they put up there was one I wrote called "The Myth of Situational Awareness," right. and in it I, I I pointed out that the idea of training of situational awareness and of training awareness as it's usually done just really isn't very applicable simply because um, sooner or later you're going to get distracted you're going to be living your life. You know, you can go around in, in condition purple with pink polka dots all you want, but sooner or later, you, you're going to have to look at your kid, or, or you're going to have to look in your date's eyes, or you're going to have to look at the menu, or you're going to have to do something, and at that point in time, the, the savvy criminal knows when you're distracted, and that's typically when they attack, and they either wait for you to become distracted yourself, or they, they manufacture a distraction of their own, be it, you know, situational or, or social. So the, the key is not to, to train awareness because I don't really think you can, but to understand that you're going to be distracted, that's when you're most vulnerable, that's probably when you're likely to get attacked, and train in defensive tactics, counter ambush tactics that work, that work when you have been surprised. Sooner or later you're going to be surprised, so the key is, the critical skill here is to to train to respond when you've been surprised, not to assume that you have this great mantle of situational awareness that's going to that's going to keep you safe. So that's that's my take on it. Paul, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that uh, that you're really pretty much right on there, Grant. The one thing that I'll add to that, and what it is that I teach my students is, I feel that awareness is an important concept to understand and to practice for two reasons. Number one, not only because we can find you know bad things in life and avoid them, but also because awareness helps us to see so many of the wonderful and fabulous things in life. Um, I, you know. I have a lot of hawks that have been flying around my neighborhood throughout the month of February, and as I watched and paid attention, was aware, I realized they were nesting about 30 feet off my back deck. And right now, my wife told me she spotted a fourth chick in the hawk's nest. Awareness, observation, what a, a fabulous thing. We've got the spotting scope out, the kids are checking out these, these hawks and their little snowballs and starting to, to uh, you know, molt real feathers, and it's going to be pretty awesome to watch them. And awareness is what it is that they found this for us. And, and, and being aware is going to find the $20 bill on the ground, and, and awareness is going to be you bumping into your long-lost high school friend at the mall, you know, from across the way that, you know, you wouldn't have noticed if you weren't being aware. All those things are great things. But the other thing that I believe awareness does for folks, this is the most important aspect of awareness, is that it deselects you as prey. I look at violent crime as an intersection between predator and prey. When there's a predator that is out there looking for that meal on the, on the African savanna, and there's prey that is not paying attention, that's wounded, that's hurt, that's you know, somehow not on their game. When those two meet, that's when trouble happens. And if I'm doing my best to be aware and pay attention to what's going on, the predator that I probably never even see looks at me and says, ah, that was too tough. I'm going to pick something easier. I'm going to look for something that's, that's lagging behind the herd. It's not paying attention. And I feel that awareness really acts as a fad of the these selector. And the cool thing is, maybe it's not cool. We'll never know how good awareness works in that aspect. Because we'll never even realize that we walk past that predator confidently aware of our surroundings, even though we weren't really aware of the situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
the uh, the uh, I think that's a, a good way of putting it. Um, the the way that I put it to my students is that and, and nobody, by the way, uh, Brian. Before you get the idea that any that that I'm poo pooing the idea of awareness, I'm not. Um, what I explain to my students is managing distraction. That's really what you're doing. You're choosing what you're going to allow yourself to be distracted by because you're you're going to have if, if for instance, you decide to look at um, the, the 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 street performer. Um, as you're looking at the street performer, your attention is, is on that person and you've chosen to be distracted by that because you've decided you've made that that sort of um, uh, value judgment in your head that it's okay for me to be distracted by this guy for a few seconds. So because it's pleasurable, I enjoy watching him, this sort of thing. Um, understanding that you're going to, to, to do that, that you're choosing that distract, distraction. It's not that you have some super, you know, um, extra awareness because you can't have extra awareness. You can only manage that with, which you have. So I call it managing distraction. Um, and that's how I put it to my students. And it's very much the same way that you put it with yours. I think, Grant, I, I'm going to have to completely disagree with you about the idea of not being able to have extra awareness you just have to hire people for that. Oh you know, yeah, that's yeah. What the you guys know. in suits are that stand out to each side, right? That's your extra awareness. That, that's right. So if you want to hire men in black to, to stand <laughs> next to you to be your awareness, and that's really that's that's really what what uh, bodyguards do. They are hired awareness, um, so that you can Absolutely. you know you can devote your your awareness to other things, and and that's an Absolutely. excellent way of putting it. I like that. I like that. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad you like it, Grant. Uh, Denim has chimed in with another question, and it's been sitting there for a little while, so I apologize, Denim, that it's taken so long. Um, just today in New Jersey, um, I've got a Beretta PX4 Storm 9mm. It shoots low, and I have to compensate. Should I get new sights? Now, I'm, I love what's happening on the right-hand side bar of the Googles, because Fred has chimed in and said, hey, Denim, has anybody else shot the Beretta and had the same result? And that's pretty much the same place I'm going to go, Denim, is have that done double-checked by somebody else that you're confident in their shooting skills and see where it shoots for them. The likelihood that the gun is shooting four inches low, I'm assuming you're talking about some reasonable distance. You don't talk about the distance here. I'm assuming you're talking about some reasonable distance, like inside seven yards. I'm guessing that's not a sight problem. It probably has to do more with a critical skill of being able to maintain your sight alignment and sight picture while you smoothly press that trigger to the rear. And that can be a challenge for a lot of folks. If you're shooting inside an indoor shooting range, put in some earplugs and put on some earmuffs, and that might help get you that trigger press, uh, you know, soften the report of the gun. Sometimes that can be really challenging for people. And then just really focus on smoothly pressing that trigger for the rear and let that trigger go back a little bit by a little bit by a little bit until it breaks and see how that does. And see if you can get a good shot. Any other thoughts for that, Grant? It's kind of hard to uh, to jump on this whole online, but hey, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's tough to do. I would say that if if because that's a double action, single action gun, um, right. the first shot is is long, heavy double action. The 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 subsequent shots are all relatively light, short, single actions. If all of your shots are hitting relatively close to each other, but they're all low, that tells you that it, that it might be a sight issue. It tells you it might be your sighting picture issue. Um, it could be right. that the ammo doesn't agree with where the sights are regulated. So you, you have some sort of mechanical problem. If, however, what's happening is that some of your shots are low and some of them are not, that tells you that it's a technique issue and probably trigger control. Um, the idea of having somebody else who you know can shoot well, shoot it, and see if they get the same results is a good one, and I would recommend that you do that. Yeah, that, that consistency um, approach Grant, really makes a lot of sense, especially with the inconsistent trigger of the Beretta Storm. That's good. Thank exactly. you. Brian, I'm glad that you're enjoying this information. I'm glad that it's helpful to you. Um, you know, Keep in mind, Brian, that we are not too well, not we. Grant is a heck of a long ways down the road. I'm not too far down the road. If you ever want to come over and do some training and, and uh, spend some time with Safety Systems Academy, we'd love to have you. This is what training is like with us. Um, even when we're out on the range. Grant, where do you want to head next with this idea of, you know, just overall encompassing critical defensive skills? Where, where do you want to go? Where haven't I gone that you want to lead to? Well, you know, the the the, the question now is, really, it really becomes, what are critical defensive skills? You know, we've talked about the idea of the concept of a def of a critical defensive skill. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about how the the student 
can identify if an instructor is, is actually teaching critical defensive skills. We've talked about how the instructor can determine whether he or she is, is in fact teaching them. Now the question really becomes, what are they? Um, I mean, in, down to finite descriptions of this is a critical skill, this is not. This is worth spending some instructional time and s some teaching time, um, some training time, some maintenance time. This is worth doing because it is applicable to to private sector self-defense, and this is not. So it really comes down to now deciding on a list of what is a critical defensive skill. Now, m for a lot of people, everybody lives a slightly different life. There may be slight differences in what is a critical defensive skill between any two people, but I think it's fair to say that the vast overwhelming majority of, of the skills will be the same between everybody, whether you live uh, in a rural environment like I do or an urban environment, a uh, suburban environment, wherever you work. Most of the skills are going to be the same. There may be you know, a few here off to the side that you need to to take a different look at than somebody else will. But for the majority of things, we know how attacks happen. Uh, we have a pretty good idea how they happen. We have a pretty good idea of how to deal with them. So now it really becomes, what is that list? What does that list look like? So Grant, I've kind of got an idea that's just coming to me in my head as we, as we go through this. And, and those of you like Ryan, um, you're gonna you're about to learn this as you teach your first concealed carry class. When you're an instructor, there's a tremendous amount of learning that goes on by verbalizing what it is that you know about other people. And so you know, as these Google Hangouts happen, I've got things going on inside my head that that uh, I don't want to say they're necessarily learning points, but they kind of coalesce things. So Grant, here's my thought. You tell me what you think about this. We've got nine folks that are on right now. Let me say that differently. I've got eight that are registering right now. We've had comments from many more folks um, throughout today's broadcast, throughout our Hangout. What if you folks, even if you're watching on YouTube after the fact, take and type out that list of what it is that you think are critical skills for you and send that list in. You can send it to um, grant at grantcunningham.com. Is that the email address you want folks to use, Grant? Does that work? Yeah, they can send it there. That's fine. Grant at grantcunningham.com or Paul at safetysolutionsacademy.com. And maybe even I'll put in a, a link to my contact page on the website up here so you folks can just click and type away. But think about what those critical skills are. As I mentioned, I wanted this to be, uh, Grant and I wanted this to be an introductory segment to the concept of critical defensive skills. That means that there's more coming. And what we want to do now is take a look at what those critical defensive skills are. And instead of us just spouting them off to you, because we think we know what we're talking about, there may be some folks out there that have ideas that are, are unique to them. So if you've got something that you think might be outside the norm, make sure you justify to us why it is that that is a critical defensive skill for you. Um, does that make sense? Grant, is that, you like that idea get some interaction going here? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You know, the... The only way sometimes we learn is to examine our beliefs, and, and part of what we believe about a critical defensive skill, uh, examine those beliefs and look at them and, and be open to the idea that, you know, I might be wrong about this. Um, and, and you and I do this all the time. I mean, we always talk about, is it possible that we're wrong in, right. in this particular point of view? And, and it we look at it. That was wrong. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it does. Um, uh, luckily, I'm not wrong that often, thankfully, uh, but my wife will tell you otherwise. Uh, um, I was not wrong about the hair, by the way. Hair, hair. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, we need to look at, at, at what we're doing and what we believe to be applicable and always be open to the idea that, 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 that maybe we're not. Um, there are a lot of things about which I've changed my mind over the last year, number of okay. years. I know there's a bunch of things about which you've changed your mind. Yeah. As we get better information, as we get new information, as we learn new things, and what is a, a critical skill, uh, a vital skill, if you will, um, is part of that. Um, I may decide tomorrow that something that I've been teaching is not is not vital, and maybe I'll relegate that to a different class. Um, you know, a class where we talk about non-vital skills. Right. Um, 
but uh, you, when we're talking about the stuff that's important to learn first, the, the, the stuff that's important to practice first, the stuff that it's important to spend more money on or more time or more energy, whatever that is, those are the things that you need to be open to changing uh, if necessary. Because I might be wrong, you might be wrong, somebody else might be wrong. Um, but you're right, and I like the, the, the fact that you put in justify it. Um, don't justify it by saying famous gunfighter said this was a critical skill. That, that's not enough. Um, you need to be able to say here, here are the reasons why, here are the, the, the plausible situation where it applies, here are the reasons that it's impo important in these plausible situations. Um, here's the, the, preferably the science behind it, the mechanics behind it. All that kind of stuff to, to as you say, justify why that is a critical skill. Now, Brian has typed over in the uh, in the sidebar, and unfortunately, I just clicked under question to queue it up, right, and then I clicked on done for some reason. I don't know why I did that. But his comment was, you know, how to carry properly, um, being a critical defensive skill. Oh, yeah. And so, Brian, go ahead and, and justify. What do you mean by carry properly? What you know, define that for us, and and send that in an email. You know, and, and you can keep going here in the in the sidebar. But we'll collect these emails, and these emails are what are going to start to help define our future episodes in this series, if that makes sense to you folks. So, you know, if you want to have a part in how this is shaped, um, send those to us. Let us know. Um, yeah, there you go, Brian. Yeah. Brian's talking about carrying properly, round in the chamber or not. Huge. I, you know, I got an email today on a video that I did where somebody disagreed with me about carrying around in the chamber, and if you're a beginner, you better not do that unless you're carrying a 1911 with a manual safety. And I mean, you know, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, right, exactly, Grant. Don't hurt yourself. Um, I don't, I don't know what else to do, um, but smack my head on that one. I didn't even respond to that to that question because I don't think the person wanted my input. I gave my input in the video, but that's exactly right. It's those kinds of issues that we need to talk about, and so bring that up, and and maybe, um, maybe that might be. I, I think that's a good one, Grant. You want to do that one next week? Yeah, talk about we, carrying we, around in the chamber. Let's make yeah, it at least part. I don't know if that covers the whole episode, but we'll make that a part of it. You know, you know and exactly. You know, the condition of the gun is certainly part of it. Uh, carrying in a way that it, you can access it is part of it. You know, you did a, uh, one, a, a hangout just a couple of days ago where you talked about uh, carrying on a motorcycle right. um, and, and how accessing it while you're on the motorcycle in motorcycling clothes uh, is certainly a critical skill, and it might be different, and as a motorcycle rider myself, I know that it is different than what I would normally carry. So that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, but at the same time, accessing it while you're going down the road at 60 miles an hour with your left hand because your right hand is the throttle hand probably isn't the biggest no, critical. No, uh, uh, un unless, um, yeah, unless you're a cyborg from the future and, you know, you've got a lever action uh, uh, shotgun, yes. then it's okay. Yes. All right. Not good. I'm glad you made the shotgun jump, Grant. I mean, I, I you know, like we talked about earlier, Fonzie, you know, I mean, it's got to go <laughs> all the way. Water ski and Jaws, maybe. It's got to go. That's but, right. Uh, well, Brian, thanks for the outstanding questions. Um, it was good to have all of you folks chime in with us tonight. And, um, hopefully you enjoyed this format, you enjoyed the context of what it is that we were talking about and, and the content is really what I meant to say, context is just on the head today because that's really what we're talking about. And hopefully you're going to be able to tune in. Our goal is to be here for the next however many Thursdays it takes us to get through these critical defensive skills and, and talk about them. And I'd be remiss to, to break away without telling you folks that these kinds of things are the kinds of things that we teach. If you come to a course with Safety Students Academy, if you go to a course with Personal Security Institute with Grant out in the Pacific Northwest, these are the kinds of things that we work very hard as instructors to try and narrow down to, to bring to you the absolute most critical skills that you'll need. And so I encourage you to, to head to personalsecurity.us and check out the course that Grant has to offer. And I encourage you to head to Safety Solutions Academy, and I'll put some links up here. Um, we've got an Ohio concealed carry course that we teach that de deals with the fundamentals of concealed carry. We also do critical defense and handgun, which again is really the critical defense of skills. And don't forget about the fact that sometime, not sometime, in July, 12th and 13th, Grant, I'm pulling that out of my head, 12th and 13th yep. of July. Yep. Yep, um, Grant Cunningham is going to be here in Northeast Ohio. He's going to be teaching defensive revolver fundamentals 
it's going to be the critical skills that you're going to need to defend yourself if you happen to carry a revolver. And I get more calls these days from folks that are talking about carrying revolvers than I ever have before. And I'll tell you what, if you carry a revolver for defensive purposes, you need to get out to this class. So you can check that out again, sign up right down here, click on this link, we'll take you with more information and get signed up to, to uh, uh, come training with us. Grant, what else do you want to talk about before we go? Anything else you want to let people know about PSI and what you're doing? Um, just the, the class that we've got coming up uh, in July. That's going to be a great class, and I hope people can make it out to that because it's going to be a wonderful time. It's a class that I enjoy teaching, and it, it's particularly applicable to those people who have who have gotten themselves a snub-nosed revolver that they're carrying uh, for self-defense or, or maybe have it as a home defense weapon. So it's going to be a great class, and I, I hope to see everybody there. Of course, check out my site, personalsecurity.us. I've got a lot of articles uh, up there right, right at the moment. I'm doing it. Uh, see a series on uh, how to protect yourself when you're traveling. You can't have the gun. Um, certainly, some critical skills there because you get on an airplane, you can't have that gun. Um, so we talk about that. Check out PersonalSecurity.us. Be sure and check out my Flipboard magazine. If you're on Flipboard, awesome app. I love Flipboard. Check out the, the Personal Security Institute magazine on Flipboard. Uh, you can find links to it on the PersonalSecurity.us website. There are links all over to it. And of course, if you're a Flipboard user, you can simply search for Personal Security Institute magazine, and uh, lots of great articles there that I that I link to. Very some timely information, uh, stuff that I just don't have time or space to get into on the website. So uh, check that out too. Be happy to have you as an, as a reader. Yeah, Grant, I got to tell you, I am so looking forward to defensive revolver fundamentals. Um, I carry a revolver every day. It's almost always my backup gun, but sometimes it's my primary, and I don't train enough with that revolver. And so I'm really looking forward to jumping into class as a student for two days and uh, and expending the ammunition to, to really gain some additional competence with that revolver or with the revolvers that I use. And so I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be great. Um, registration is cooking a lot, folks. If you're interested in coming to this course, you probably want to jump on again. The link's right down here. You probably want to jump on and get registered pretty quickly. Um, you know, we're we're having some solid registrations. I know July seems like a long ways away. It's going to be here before you know it. And there's a whole group of people out there that are planning their training for the summer, and they're already signing up for classes. So make sure you you jump online and get registered for that. If you're looking for something that's more centered towards the semi-automatics, we've got classes coming up um, December December. June 7th and 8th, we'll be here in Garrettsville, Ohio with Critical Defensive Handgun. Also on June 8th, we've got an Ohio Concealed Carry course. Get registered for those courses. These are skills that even if you've trained them before, are definitely skills that you curate. So make sure you keep them up to par. Um, don't buy yourself a 48-inch Epson printer. No, Grant, really, right now I'm talking to you. Don't buy yourself a 48-inch Epson <laughs> inkjet printer. Okay? Yeah, I, I won't. Trust me. Trust me, I, I've made that decision. I, I'm spending the money on delicious cider instead. Oh, very good, Grant. That's outstanding. You feel very better good. than that printer. The printer will make you want to smash your head against the wall. Folks, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, yeah, Fred, you can't see the links right now. I'm sorry. I'll get those links up in the show notes. Um, if you go to my website, Critical Defensive Handgun, um, or the Defensive Revolver, excuse me, Fundamentals of Defensive Revolver, under the courses section, those are right there, but they don't show up right now. That's just for the whole YouTube after crowd. They're not as cool as you, but they get some extra benefits. So watch it on YouTube, share with your friends, all that kind of stuff. Grant, I want to say thanks so much for taking the time to uh, to be with us tonight. Uh, sorry about the technical uh, issues with Google's a horror uh, at the beginning of the broadcast, and hopefully uh, things will go smoother next Thursday. And uh, I look forward to, to chatting with you again, my, my friend. I look forward to seeing you in July as well. Stay out of trouble, okay? I will. Thanks very much. No problem. Folks, biggest thing that I can tell you is when you figure out what those critical skills are, no matter who it's with, I don't care if it's with Safety Solutions Academy or if it's Grant Cunningham, find somebody that you're confident in as a trainer. Get on out there. Get yourself some training. When you do, make sure you keep it simple. Please stay safe, and as always, have a great day.